Last week, we started this series called Surviving the Storms of Life. We're going to continue that today. Now, I know you know this, but storms are inevitable in our lives. They happen to everyone. Mature, spiritual, uh, spiritually mature people, spiritually immature people, young people, old people, all people. We all face storms in life. And so the key to surviving a storm in life is what do you do uh, when you start hearing the voices? Now, I'm not talking about the crazy voices, okay? If you start hearing those voices, you need to go to the doctor, okay? I'm not talking about that. But I'm talking about what voices are you going to listen to? The key to surviving the storm is choosing what voice you listen to. Now, They're going to speak to you during the difficult times. Uh, Circumstances are going to talk to you. They're going to just kind of try to point out the fact that your circumstances are bad. But you know what circumstances do? They lie. They don't always tell you the truth. And if you listen to your circumstances, you're going to be up sometimes and down sometimes. You're going to be encouraged sometimes and discouraged sometimes, because it will completely depend on your circumstances. So you can't listen to your circumstances, and you certainly can't listen to your feelings, because we all have feelings, and we all have uh, emotions, and we uh, become emotional about certain things. Now, if you don't think that God is interested in your dealing with your feelings, then don't read the book of Psalms. Did you know that King David wrote most of the Psalms. He didn't write them all, but he wrote most of them. And did you know that in many of the Psalms, David is dealing with his emotions. He says, God, it feels like you've abandoned me. God, it feels like there's no hope. But he rejected the lies of his feelings. And by the end of the Psalm, he always comes back to his faith. Okay. So you got to decide what you're going to listen to. What voice are you going to listen to? Are you going to listen to circumstances? Are you going to listen to your feelings? Are you going to listen to naysayers? Did you know that the devil will provide you with a lot of naysayers in your life? Oh, you can't do that. Oh, they're asking too much of that. Oh, that's not really what God wants. Oh, that is unreasonable. You shouldn't even expect uh, to do that. They're naysayers. Did you know that Job's wife was a naysayer? Do you remember the story of Job? Job was very successful, very wealthy, very powerful. And in a single day, he lost everything. He lost all of his wealth. He lost his family. And then in another day, he lost his health. I mean, he literally lost the most precious things to to him in his life. And here's what his wife said when he was suffering, okay? Did she lift him up? Did she encourage him? No, she said... Curse God and die. Well, thank you, honey. Thank you for that word of encouragement, okay? But look, the truth is, she was a naysayer. And there are going to be naysayers in your life. Who are you going to listen to? Now, here is a difficult thing that some people uh, try to deal with. And it is that sometimes we don't discern the voice of God in our life. Sometimes we confuse circumstances or feelings or naysayers even with the voice of God. Now, there are others that think that God doesn't actually speak to you. But the the Bible is is clear. God will speak to you if you'll seek him. Now, we don't always recognize the voice of God. The primary way he speaks to us is through the word of God. Okay? God will speak to every person, every Christian. He will speak to you. But you got to listen. You got to discern. And so today I'm going to talk about uh, letting God speak to you during the storm. Now, the story we're going to read today is about Elijah. And uh, let me just set this up. Um, Elijah lived during the time of King Ahab of Israel. Now, who was Ahab? Well, he was the king of Israel and he was married to, do you recall, Jezebel. That was a real person, okay? And we use that kind of as a, 
uh, a euphemism for people now, but she was a real queen, a real person, and she and her husband were wicked, very wicked. They led the Israelites to worship Baal, and uh, they did all kinds of things that were displeasing to God. They were just wicked, wicked people, and Elijah was a prophet of God. And God had called him to call out the word of God to this king and this queen, and they hated him. And to, to kind of condense a, a long story, um, Elijah told King Ahab that it wasn't going to rain for about three years. And for about three years, it did not rain at all. Now think about that. It caused a drought. It caused a famine. It caused economic problems. It caused all kinds of problems. But it was the judgment of God. Um, and then uh, Elijah challenged. There were prophets of Baal rather than the prophets of Yahweh, the Lord God Yahweh. Uh, there were prophets of Baal, and there were 450 of these prophets. And so Elijah, he challenged the Israelites. And here's what he said. We're going to set up a sacrifice you set up your sacrifice, I'll set up mine, and we're going to pray. We're not going to light the sacrifice on fire. We're going to pray, and whoever's God answers by raining down fire out of heaven and, and consuming the sacrifice, that's the one we're going to worship. That's the one that we're going to say, that's God. That is who we will worship. And so anyway, uh, they set up the sacrifice, and... Uh, the prophets of Baal had theirs, and Elijah had his. And the prophets of Baal, they began to pray. They began to scream. They began to dance around. They even began to cut themselves. I mean, it was, it was quite a spectacle. But as you can imagine, their God, Baal, did not answer their prayer. And then Elijah, he comes, and he did something pretty incredible um, there was a drought, a severe drought, and so he'd set up his sacrifice, and he said, I want you to get a barrel of water and pour it over top of my sacrifice, and he did that. He did it multiple times, and uh, it says that he dug a trench, a ditch around his sacrifice, and there was so much water poured on the sacrifice that it filled up the trench. It filled up the ditch, and Elijah prayed a very short prayer. He just said, God, uh, you show us who you are, show us your power, and God did. The Bible, and I love one of my favorite phrases in the Old Testament. It says, and then the fire fell. Then the fire fell. Aren't you glad that God will let the fire fall at the right time? Well, look, the bottom line is uh, that the fire did fall, and not only did it consume the water, it consumed the sacrifice, it even consumed the stones of the altar. It was incredible. And so Elijah, uh, to once again condense a very long story, um, he said, go and look, we're getting ready to have some rain. And Elijah killed, or had killed, 450 prophets of Baal. He killed them all. Now think about this incredible act of heroism he delivered Israel. They began to worship him. He uh, just did a lot of things uh, just through the power of God. And, the next, and we're going to pick up the story here. The next day, the next day, Jezebel, the queen, she threatens him. She threatens to kill him. And so here's where we pick up the story in 1 Kings chapter 19, verse number 1. It says, and when Ahab got home, he told Jezebel everything Elijah had done, including the way he had killed all the prophets of Baal. And so Jezebel sent this message to Elijah. May the gods strike me and even kill me if by this time tomorrow I have not killed you just as you killed them. And Elijah was afraid and fled for his life. Now, does this seem out of character? I mean, here's a man that faced 450 prophets. He just prayed and God sent fire out of heaven. I mean, my goodness, this man was a man of faith. He had prayed and God held the rain for three years. He prayed again and it rained. I mean, this was an incredibly 
an incredible man of faith, but he got afraid of the queen. Elijah was afraid and fled for his life, and he went to Beersheba, a town in Judah. Now, a lot of times when we read in the Bible, we read something and we don't really get the impact. Uh, he went on a journey of about 120 miles, okay? And he did it on foot, okay? So you can imagine he was pretty tired by the time he got there. Uh, he said he went to Beersheba, a town in Judah, and he left his servant there. And then he went on uh, alone into the wilderness, traveling all day, and he sat down under a solitary broom tree and prayed that he might die. I've had enough, Lord. Have you ever prayed that prayer? God, I've had enough. Can't take any more. Well, he was there. He said, take my life, for I'm no better than my ancestors who have already died. And then he lay down and slept under the broom tree. But as he was sleeping, an angel touched him and told him, get up and eat. And he looked around, and there beside his head was some bread baked on hot stones and a jar of water. So he ate and drank and lay down again. And then the angel of the Lord came and touched him and said, touched him again and said, get up and eat some more for the journey ahead will be too much for you. So he got up and he ate and drank and, had, and the food gave him enough strength to travel 40 days and 40 nights. Now he probably already traveled seven days so he's going further. He went to Mount Sinai and the Lord, uh, the mountain of the Lord, and he came to a cave. And when he spent the night, where he spent the night, but the Lord said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? Now that's a great question, isn't it? And it's a question we need to learn to ask ourselves Why am I here? What's going on? Why am I reacting the way I'm reacting? We need to ask good questions. God said, what are you doing here, Elijah? And Elijah replied, and, and notice his pity party. I have zealously served the Lord God Almighty, but the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you, torn down your altars, and killed every one of your prophets. Everyone? You're still alive? Have they killed all of them? And I am the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. Boo-hoo-hoo. I mean, big pity party. And then notice what God said. He said, go out and stand before me on the mountain. And Elijah stood there, and the Lord passed by, and a mighty windstorm hit the mountain. It was such a terrible blast from the rocks were torn loose, but the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, there was a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, there was the sound of a gentle whisper. I love it in some translations, it reads, a still, small voice. Sometimes we expect God to be in the windstorm, or the earthquake, or the fire, but the way God will speak to you, the way you can find God's voice in the middle of the storm, is not through the raucous noise, but it's through the stillness. By the way, do you know sometimes why we don't ever hear the voice of God? It's because all we do is participate in the storm. We're just like, in the wind, and we're in the fire, and we're in the earthquake, and we don't ever take the time to just stop and listen for the still, small voice of God. And when Elijah heard it, the voice of God, he wrapped his face in his cloak and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave, and a voice said again, what are you doing here, Elijah? Do you think that this was an important question? By the way, do you think God knew why he was there? Of course he did. He wasn't asking this question for his curiosity. He wasn't asking this question for his information. He was asking this question to help Elijah ask the right question. He was asking it for Elijah's sake. Elijah, 
Why are you here? What are you doing? And notice what he did. He replied again. I have zealously served the Lord God Almighty, but the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you, torn down your altars, and killed every one of your prophets. I'm the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. Hmm. And then the Lord said to him, don't you love how God sometimes speak to us, speaks to us, sometimes he speaks to us in that gentle whisper like we need, and then sometimes he just gets right to the point. He says, go back the way you came. The same way you came, Elijah, go back. Go back and travel to the wilderness of Damascus. And then notice that he got Elijah busy again doing what he was supposed to be doing. Here's what he said. And then anoint Jehu, the grandson of Nimshi, to be the king of Israel. And anoint Elisha, the son of Shaphat, from the town of Abel, Mahola, to replace you as my prophet. And anyone who escapes from Haziel will be killed by Jehu, and those who escape Jehu will be killed by Elisha. And yet I will preserve 7,000 others for Israel, in Israel, who have never bowed down to Baal or kissed him. Now, I find it interesting that Elijah, in a fit of discouragement, in the middle of a storm, he thought he was the only one. But God had already preserved 7,000 other prophets. He had preserved them. Elijah wasn't the only one. And I must tell you, when you and I feel like we're the only one, when we're the only one in the storm, when we're the only one that's facing difficulty, when we are the only one that's having a problem, you're not. You're not. God's with you. Somebody else has gone through that storm already. They've already experienced it. They can look back. They can help you, okay? You are not alone. And that's important to note. Well, Elisha made some critical mistakes that led him to the point of giving up. I mean, Elijah was discouraged, right? He was depressed, right? I mean, you don't get to the point where you say, take my life, I don't want to live, I don't want to do this anymore, unless you get to extreme depression. But he lost his desire to serve God. He lost his desire to do what God had called him to do. He lost his desire even to live. And so I want to point out just a few things, and, and you can write these down, you can follow them online, you can go to uh, the Church Center app. You can go to the Bible app, um, and, and you can look at our notes, and it'll help you during the week. But I want to do a comparison contrast on several things, okay? I want to present to you the problem and the solution. The problem and the solution. I see several problems that Elijah faced, several mistakes that he made, and I also see the solution so that if you're going through the storm, if you're feeling like that you don't want to live anymore, you want to give up, or you don't want to serve God anymore, you can deal with the problem and you can find a solution. So let, let's, let's get into this. Problem, relying on past victories. Solution, exercise a present faith. Now, what did uh, Elijah do? What was his problem? Well, do you remember, you recall, and once again, remember that sometimes in reading Scripture, uh, even though it's condensed, we feel like that, you know, this happens in the next 10 minutes, and it could be quite a while. And so um, Elijah was living in the past. He was living in his past victories, and he was not practicing a present faith to deal with the current problems. So what you and I have got to learn to do is we've got to trust God for now. Now, I love the fact that um, our past victories can help us, okay? They can help us turn to God. They can help us have confidence in God. But your past victories will not fight your current battles. You see, Elijah, just before, had defeated the prophets of Baal. He had defied the king and the queen of Israel. He had seen a great victory. He had seen God's power. Look, I don't know about you, but if I had been the one that prayed 
and God sent down fire out of heaven, I'd be pretty impressed by that, okay? I probably want to remember that. But do not mistake what was going on here. The reason Elijah felt like quitting, the reason he was not hearing the right voice in the storm was he was depending on past faith for current problems. And and I must tell you, you can have been in church all your life growing up as a kid. And that's good. That's wonderful if you've had that experience. But that's not going to solve your current problem. Uh, You can have seen great victories in your life. And that's wonderful. You can draw strength from that. But listen, you need now kind of faith. You need faith to trust God in the storm right now. That's what you got to do. You got to trust Him now. Don't worry about the past victories. That's wonderful. But you got to have a current faith. And by the way, you won't keep your faith strong if you abandon what got you there in the first place. That's why I always marvel at people that think that, well, you know, I don't really need church that much. And then they, they drift, spiritually speaking, emotionally speaking, in every way. And they wake up. And they're in a place they never imagined they would be in. And they wonder, they scratch their head, how did I get here? How did I get so far away from God? Well, it's kind of like the frog in the kettle. You know the story about the frog in the kettle, supposedly that you can put a frog and you can throw a frog in a pot of boiling water and it'll jump right out because it's too hot. It jumps out. But you can put a, a frog in a kettle and slowly heat the water up to boiling temperature. And it said, I've never done this myself, it said that that frog will stay in the water and it will boil to death. It will meet its demise because gradually and slowly all around it, the temperature changes. And what you and I need to understand is past faith is not enough for a present victory. It's wonderful to have that past victory, but you got to have a present victory faith in God right now. So that was the problem. Uh, Number two, problem, allowing fear to dominate. Solution, trusting faith to deliver. Now, I'm not blaming Elijah for being afraid. I mean, if the queen said, I'm going to kill you, I would probably be afraid too, okay? And you probably would too. But When you allow fear to dominate your life rather than your faith. Once again, he had just seen God shut the heavens for three years. He had just seen God deliver them from 450 prophets of Baal. He had just seen the fire of heaven fall. Okay, so it's not like he did not experience the power of God. But he allowed his fear to dominate him rather than his faith. And I must say that it's easy to allow our fear to dominate us. But let me just tell you something about fear. Fear is destructive. It will destroy your faith if you allow it. Fear is a distraction. You know what the devil wants to do to you? He wants to get your eyes off of God and onto your problems. Off of uh, what God wants you to do and onto difficulties. He wants you to focus on that. Do you remember the story of Peter getting out of the boat and walking on the water and he was doing so well and all of a sudden he started seeing the storm around him, the wind and the waves and what happened to him? He immediately began to sink. And so when you and I focus on the fear, when we focus on the difficulties, it will immediately cause us to sink. But you know what fear is as well? It's a distortion It's a distortion of reality. Now, I've always bragged, you know, as a man, that I'm not afraid of very many things. Um, And that's true, I'm not afraid of most things, but there are some things I'm afraid of. And uh, I'm not afraid to admit it, okay? Even though it may not look like I'm a very manly man when I admit these things, okay? I'm afraid of spiders. I do not know why, okay? Yeah, I do. When I was about five years old, I was running through the woods and uh, you know those big black and yellow spiders that make those weird-looking uh, 
Uh, we used to say they would write your name in a, in a web. They're about this big around. I was running, and I was just tall enough that I hit one of those with my face, and that spider was on my face, okay? And uh, I still have not gotten over that trauma, okay? So, so yeah, I, I don't like spiders. The other day, I was going out to uh, feed my dogs, and uh, I was walking by. didn't see this spider web, and there was a spider about this big, ugly, hideous-looking thing, okay? And I hit it and like, ugh, you know, jumping around just as a grown man, you know, being a little afraid. But you know what fear is? It's, it's a distortion. If you want to be honest, that spider that I hit the other day, it's not even poisonous. It, 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 there's really nothing it could do to me unless I allow myself to be afraid of it, okay? You know what fear is? It's a distortion. Now, because I ran into that spider web when I was five years old and that spider was on my face, um, it's distorted my view of spiders, okay? I don't like them. I don't want them. Uh, even little tiny ones, I do not like, okay? Now, what am I saying about fear? When you allow fear to dominate, you know what happens? Everything in life is distorted. And when you operate in fear, your future looks distorted, your present circumstances look distorted because it will distort everything around you. Well, what was another problem that Elijah faced? Problem was exhaustion. He was tired. What is the solution? Maintain spiritual disciplines. Maintain your spiritual routines. Now notice what uh, it, was, it was said about him. He didn't take care of himself. He was exhausted. Do you know I personally believe when you allow yourself to get to the point of exhaustion or so tired, you don't make good decisions. Good decisions are made ahead of time, not in the middle of the battle, okay? You got to train yourself to make good decisions ahead of time. Now, you one thing you need to learn, and, and I know this sounds uh, maybe not super spiritual, but it, I think it's true. If you don't learn to keep your routines and your disciplines, then you're going to get tired. You're going to get exhausted. We all get tired. Uh, but you're going to get so exhausted that you're going to quit, that you're going to give up. And it's incredibly important. Yeah, you got to have resolve. you got to have determination. Yeah. But you know what you got to do to keep that determination? you got to keep your routines. you got to keep... Uh, I believe, spiritual disciplines. We see that Elijah, he was exhausted. He didn't keep his spiritual routines. You stop reading the Bible. You stop praying regularly. You stop going to church. And I can promise you, I can promise you, you're going to get exhausted, spiritually speaking. And you're going to want to give up. you got to maintain those disciplines. you got to maintain those routines. Well, what was the next problem? His next problem was isolation. Did you notice how he isolated himself? What's the solution? Participate with a team. That's what Elijah needed to learn to do. You and I need to learn to do the same things. We cannot isolate ourselves and think that we're going to be okay. And I'm talking about spiritually, but not just spiritually. When you isolate yourself physically from people, when you isolate yourself socially, God designed you to live with other people and to be among friends and have relationships, okay? When you isolate yourself, then you become susceptible to discouragement. You become susceptible to spiritual defeat. So what's the solution? Well, I believe the solution is found in the church. God wants you, God wants me to participate with the team. What team? The church. He wants you to go to church. He wants you to be in a small group. He wants you to serve. He wants you to be a part because when you do this, you are no longer isolated. That was part of Elijah's problem. And then problem, Elijah asked the wrong questions. What's the solution? Coming back to your core purpose. Now you're going to ask questions, but God's got a question for you. What are you doing here? Why are you here? Why are you acting this way? Why are you behaving this way? Okay. Um, 
Elijah was just simply asking the wrong questions, and you and I tend to ask the wrong questions. Why is this happening to me? Why does this keep on happening? Is this fair? And we ask questions that are normal and natural to ask, but they're not the right questions. Elijah needed to come back to his core purpose that he had just forgotten for a little bit. His core purpose was to serve God, was to get the people to worship God. And if he had remembered that, then he would not have said, I'm going to quit. He would not have run in fear. And when you and I understand that God wants us to come back to the core purpose of serving him, that in and of itself will help you. That in and of itself will encourage you. It will give you strength and help you hear the voice of God during the storm. Well, here's the last problem. He misunderstood God's voice. What was the solution? Listen to the still, small voice of God. Now, I can tell you this. Um, the devil's going to provide voices for you, okay? And I don't mean the ones that are like, oh, they're coming to take me away. No, I don't mean that, okay? I, I'm talking about you're going to listen to circumstances, the lies of the enemy, the naysayers, the emotions, or you can choose to hear God's still, small voice. Now, I could go into what does the wind and the earthquake and the fire represent, but I'm not going to do that. I want it to be sufficient for us to see that what we must do is listen to the still, small voice of God. And by the way, you cannot hear a still, small voice if you're paying attention to the storm, to the wind, to the fire, okay? You got to hear the still, small voice of God. So how do you do that? Well, I'm going to just give you some very practical things to hear the voice of God. Number one, uh, you do this through regular worship. Every time. Not sometimes. Every time I come to church, I hear the voice of God. Now, I don't hear it audibly, um, though if God chose to do that, he could. But I'm just simply saying, every time I come to church, if I'm listening, I'll hear God speak to me about something. Uh, you can hear the voice of God uh, through uh, regular worship. You can hear the voice of God through quiet time and Bible reading. You need to do that. You want to be able to get direction from God? You want God to speak to you? You ever feel like God does not speak to you? Maybe it's because you're not listening. Because if you'll read the Word of God, I promise you God will speak to you. Okay? Um, we hear God's voice through prayer, through worship, listening to Christian music, uh, small group participation. And, and this is going to sound a little strange, you... Uh, listen or hear the voice of God through Christian fellowship. Christian fellowship. And I don't mean just sitting around eating nachos and watching football, okay? But I'm talking about coming alongside each other. That's what the word means. It means to uh, the Christian, the, the Greek word for fellowship is koinonia, and it means to come alongside of someone. So when you are ministering alongside of someone, you're fellowshipping. When you're going to help someone that's in the hospital, you're fellowshipping. When you're going to minister with someone or pray with someone or serve with someone, you are fellowshipping. And that's why I've said this before. Serving is fellowship at the highest level. You want to fellowship? Just get on a team. Serve. Do something that is going to let Others know that you depend on them and they depend on you. And you will fellowship. You will fellowship. Well, faith trumps facts. Aren't you glad for that? Faith trumps facts. Storms are temporary. Failure is not final. And God will always be with you in the storm. And he'll speak to you if you'll listen. So my prayer for you today is this, that you hear the voice of God and let God speak to you in the storm. Well, 
salvation is the first step to finding real peace in the storm. You cannot have it, peace I'm talking about, without salvation. And you'll never know true peace until you get saved. And so today, if you would like to be saved, if you know what that means, if you're not sure, I'll talk with you afterwards if you'd like to speak to me. If you're online, uh, maybe you say something like this in a prayer to God. Heavenly Father, I believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for my sins. I receive you as my Savior right now. I believe that Jesus is the Son of God and He resurrected from the grave and that if I come into relationship with you, you will forgive me. And Lord, I'm asking you to redeem me, to forgive me right now. If you'll pray that, God promises that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And so what is your next step? Do you need to get involved in a small group? Well, we got that starting back up. Do you need to get involved in a ministry? Do you need to get connected? Do you need to go through the next step class? Do you need to get baptized? What is your next step? I encourage you to take that next step. And then uh, if you are uh, today, if you are in a storm and you need prayer, I want to pray for you. And, and I'm not going to ask you to bow your head. Uh, but how many would say, Pastor, I'm experiencing a storm right now. Pray for me. Anybody like that? A lot of people. A lot of people. We're all in storms, okay? But let's pray together. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that you would help us to keep our eyes on you in the storm. Help us to hear your voice in the storm. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. I'm going to ask our ushers to come and uh, go ahead and pass the buckets. If you want to participate in the offering at this time, drop your Next Step card in uh, or your offering. And that's one of four ways. Come on, guys, if y'all could. Uh, that's one of uh, four ways that you can give. You can drop it in the bucket right now when it passes. Or you can give online. Go to stillwaters.online and you can sign up or you can uh, go through that and give online. Or maybe you would like to give by text, you can text the number 84321, 84321, and uh, you can text that number and give that way, or you can give in the Church Center app. You get the app on your phone, and uh, it is the most convenient way to give. Uh, it keeps up with all your giving. It helps you find sermon notes, and uh, you can watch sermons, and you can get announcements, and you sign up for stuff. So if you'd like to be a part of that, uh, then you go and get the, uh, the Church Center app, okay? All right. Well, I want you to know that I appreciate you being here today, and um, thankful for our worship team. They did a good job leading us, and uh, you know, I was talking about Elijah today. Well, we had Elijah singing for us today, not the Old Testament prophet, that'd be a little weird, but... Uh, but uh, the, the young man that's a part of our youth ministry here, and he did a great job. Didn't he do a good job? Let's, uh... And I th he's 13 years old, 13 years old. He's big for 13, isn't he? All right, so, and uh, he, he's got a great voice. So, uh, but uh, thank you so much for being a part of the service today. I love you. Have a great week. We'll see you next Sunday.